I'm really excited to bring this story exclusively to our viewers. One of the first times these two prestigious UK universities are endorsing such a passive tracking green fund. And joining me to discuss is Ashley Fagan, head of ETF indexing and smart beta strategic clients at Amundi. Ashley, first off, thank you so much for joining. Um, so looking at some of the specifics of this fund, so it's going to replicate the MSCI uh, All Country World Index, strip out any fossil fuels as well as any controversies seeded by Clare College uh, at Cambridge University. So what was the thought process behind having this track the performance of the All Country World Index versus just a pure exposure to green companies? Hi, Danny. Yeah, we're really excited about this fund launch today and being able to partner with such world-renowned institutions this fund will uh, address the financial risk of climate change, and it goes a step further compared to most products that are available out there today in terms of completely removing the energy sector. Thus, it addresses the risk of both stranded assets as well as companies that have direct economic exposure to fossil fuels. So using an index tracker fund was a way that the uh, college endowments at Cambridge and Oxford were able to address the specific requirements and objectives around ESG that they wanted to integrate. So it sounds that this will then replace the equity exposure as a whole, that this will be sort of the new core exposure. Uh, is the idea then that this would outperform over time versus just a plain vanilla uh, equity fund? Yeah, I think it's in a really interesting point that you bring there in terms of we're really seeing ESG become mainstream. It's replacing the core of portfolios now. It's not just you know niche thematic sitting in a very specific ethical portfolio. So indeed, these clients are looking to replace their equity portfolios and move to this uh, low carbon solution to address all the financial risks that we discussed in terms of climate change and these exposures that over the long term can have an impact on performance, as you say. Mm, so an impact on performance. But what about an impact on the company itself? Because this is a passive fund, were there any concerns from these endowments that they maybe couldn't have as active of a discussion with the companies or an impact when it comes to sustainability? Yeah, it's a really, really common misconception that we get that if you're investing actively, uh, passively, rather, can you have an active approach in terms of voting and engagement and influence with companies? And in fact, it is not true at all in terms of active stewardship. It's not passive or active. So at Amundi, for example, we have a very active voting and engagement policy that applies to all the portfolios, regardless of whether they're managed in a passive or active way. And actually, if you look at the amount of index assets managed globally, this has the power to be a very, very large voice and have a really big impact overall. So have these endowments asked you then on their behalf to be more active with these companies to, prom to promote those sorts of things? We already have a very active voting and engagement policy. But we are looking to collaborate and, you know, for example, the universities do a lot of research in this area and I think there is an opportunity for us to really partner and look at best practices in terms of engagement and voting with companies. So iShares also launched a somewhat similar product last week uh, for Oxford's endowment as well. Uh, is this a space that you're seeing a lot of competition? How hot is this sort of arms race now for endowment assets? It's a really good question as well in terms of absolutely. It's been a remarkable year in terms of new product launches, especially on the ESG side. We see a lot of growth in passive. We really welcome competition, and it's being driven by demand and by innovation. So these are things that are really positive developments for everyone. So what's the thought then in getting beyond uh, endowment money for this? It was seeded by one of the college endowments. Uh, what's your plan for attracting other institutions to this fund? I think the really important thing about ESG, I mean, there's two things. One is we're really in the middle of an ESG revolution, and Europe has been a leader when it comes to ESG. So at Amundi, we've been one of the first companies to really take responsible investing seriously, and we developed the first low-carbon indices back in 2014. Those are available in ETFs, so anybody, um, all types of investors can buy them. But it's really important that with ESG, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So you have off-the-shelf, um, ready, you know, ready-to-buy ETFs, in ESGs across different intensities. You have climate ETFs and index funds available for investors, but you also have the opportunity where some sophisticated investors may want to incorporate really, really specific ESG requirements or objectives, like in this case, where we're completely excluding the energy sector uh, in addition to, to many other factors. And that uh, 
nature allows us to, you know, work with those kind of clients to develop more customized solutions as well. Mm. So more customized solutions. And you mentioned the off the shelf as well, but certainly there are already a lot of strategies out there. ESG is so popular, especially here in Europe. What do you see is left? Where are the gaps that you would like to fill in terms of building out new products for Mundi? I see there's really three main areas where there's still space for future development in this um, area. One is around more granular exposures. So if you look at the broad indices, MSCI World, MSCI Europe, of course, there are a lot of ESG products already available off the shelf, as you say. Um, however, if you look at things like single country ETFs, um, there's, less, uh, there's less availability in terms of those products. For example, we've just launched a UK SRIX fossil fuel ETF. I think we'll still continue to see more of these types of products launched because as asset allocators look to replace their core portfolios with ESG building blocks, they need these exposures as well as the larger uh, indices. There's also fixed income. So this year has been a huge year for equity ESG, but I really believe that fixed income will be the next big transition. And the Mm. third area is around thematics in ESG. So there's still a lot of innovation in the space. There's a lot of active funds, but there's not that many actually thematic ESG ETFs. And I believe the climate theme will be a big topic as well going forward. Mm. So with these asset managers who you've had these conversations with, be it thematic or fixed income, have you had a lot of people come to you looking at seeding more funds uh, like you've done with uh, Cambridge? Yes, absolutely. So the, the demand both for the existing product range, which we've extended uh, and, and is available um, all across in terms of if you look at the broader ETF uh, range, it's, there's a lot of different, let's say, flavors of ESG or ESG intensities that are available to suit all kinds of investor needs. Right. But as mentioned, you do have more, uh, because of this, um, it, it can be quite a complex topic when you look at things like maybe improving specific carbon emissions or, um, you know, very, very specific exclusions that investors might have demand for. So from that perspective, we are having a lot of conversations with investors around developing bespoke solutions as well. Right. Well, Ashley, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, That's Ashley Fagan, head of ETF Smart Beta and indexing strategic clients. Fran, it sounds like we can expect more of these types of ETFs to come and more institutions looking to seed them.